You'd think that after many, many years, alternative medicine would die out, you know, because people would realize it doesn't work, but yet it's still such a huge business. Just the idea of being cured by something as simple as, say, juicing is keeping it alive, and that's pretty sad. Giving people false hope is horrible. I don't wish that even upon my worst enemy. Well, except for Bob. Fuck you, Bob. Are you watching this, Bob? Fuck you. Anyway, this video was sent to me and has quite a lot of views, which is scary. It always hurts my blood when I see a video bashing on modern medicine. Seriously, I mean, free speech is important and all, but whatever, let's just roll the clip. Today we are talking about cancer and how we already know many cures for cancer. So I want to tell you, everything that I'm about to tell you is not my opinion, nor is it theory. It is fact. You must be pretty confident if you're just going to say it's fact. To my viewers, I've already seen the video ahead of time before recording this, and I'll just tell you on a little secret. Just a little itty bitty secret. Don't tell anyone else now. It's important that this stays only between you and me. Alright, you ready? It's not fact. In the 1900s, in the early 1900s, cancer was showing up in about one in every 20 people. By the time we got to 1970s, it was showing up in one in every 10 people. And presently today, cancer is afflicting one in three people. If you're wondering why the rates of cancer has significantly increased in the last few decades, that's very simple. Cancer affects older people more often. When you live longer, you accumulate more mutations, which overall has a higher chance of affecting a core oncogene or tumor suppressor. That's why cancer at a young age is relatively rare. In the early 1900s, life expectancy in the United States was hovering just below 50. And if you're younger than 50, you have a pretty good chance of not having cancer. But of course, at the end of the day, it's just a roll of the dice. Life expectancy now is almost 80 years. That's a 30-year difference. And if you're approaching 80, your chances of cancer are much higher than if you were 50. This increase in life expectancy is due to many factors, including better healthcare and better technology that provides everyone with good resources such as clean water. As we are eliminating other diseases, cancer has been able to creep its way in due to people living longer. It's not a grand conspiracy where the doctors are purposely giving more people cancer. It's just a simple fact of the nature of cancer in our improved healthcare system. So if you got a cancer diagnosis in the 1950s, they would tell you that you had one in three chances of survival. That is still the same today. So despite, million, despite billions of dollars actually being raised annually for this type of cancer and that type of cancer, in almost 70 years, there has been absolutely no improvement in our cancer. And in fact, it has gotten much worse. What? Your chances of survival are based entirely on what type of cancer it is and how far it has progressed. You can't just have a flat number 1 in 3 for all cases. But regardless of that, cancer survival rates have been improving, especially for breast and prostate cancer, along with many, many others. Now, they don't all improve at the same rate. Pancreatic cancer, for example, is a difficult one to deal with, partly because it shows almost no symptoms in its early stages, so diagnosis is often very late. That's a scary one to have, folks. You don't want pancreatic cancer. It's one of the worst ones to get. Anyway, the most common types of cancer, such as breast, prostate, lung, testicular, etc., have all improved its five-year survival rates over the last few decades. There used to be a stigma around cancer being so horrible and it's basically a death sentence, but not anymore. We're not as scared of cancer as we used to be. I mean, sure, as long as the five-year survival rates aren't 100%, there are always ways we can improve treatment. Researchers working in the back lines of medicine are the ones to constantly discover new things and to develop new drugs for treatment. Doctors who work in the front lines are always looking for better ways to improve the health of their patients. There is so much effort being poured into this. We are currently fighting one of the biggest barriers in medicine. We're taking on cancer, for God's sake. And every paper published is another step to defeating this demon. Just imagine how long people would be able to live if we solved this mystery. Currently, the only legal ways to treat cancer are surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Okay, first of all, that's not true. You have immunotherapy, which has been gaining a lot of popularity in recent years. You have antibody therapy, hormone therapy, and you can also receive drugs that really aren't part of any category, such as anti-angiogenic drugs. The list goes on and on. And even chemotherapy isn't just one treatment. It's often a combination of drugs which are selected out of a massive list of different drugs. Sure, some are more popular than others, but different patients receive different combinations of drugs depending on what type of cancer they have. Just to name a few, there's cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, bleomycin, docetaxel, the list goes on and on. There are dozens of different drugs used in chemotherapy. Saying that the only legal ways to treat cancer are chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery is not only dishonest, it's just flat out wrong. But a lot of alternative medicine proponents refer to those three specifically because I guess frankly they don't know enough about cancer to realize that other treatments exist. Two out of those three methods, radiation and chemotherapy, are actually carcinogenic. 
So you're basically claiming that doctors are pretending to treat your cancer while actually giving you cancer. Interesting claim you got there. You know, chemotherapy and radiation are indeed very popular methods of treating cancer. Let's talk about radiation first. I guess you could sort of call it a carcinogen since it causes DNA damage, but it's not what you may think. Here's how it works. Radiation kills cancer cells by inducing DNA breakage. Wait a minute, I hear you asking. DNA damage is essentially just mutations, and mutations is what causes cancer. And that's a good point to make. First of all, the radiation is targeted specifically on tumor cells, that is, regular cells are mostly spared by aiming radiation from different locations where the intersection is where the tumor resides. Hold on another second I hear you asking, but if you mutate cancer cells they'll just go further out of control and be more difficult to treat. While that statement is true to some degree, radiation therapy induces more DNA damage than usual, which induces apoptosis. Essentially we are accelerating programmed cell death which in this case can be thought of as a gradient. The more DNA damage the more likely apoptosis will occur. So by further inducing this damage we can kill cancer cells by the very mechanism programmed within them. So yes, radiation does does cause mutations technically, but it's for a cause that will ultimately benefit the patient. Now let's look at chemotherapy. Of course the mechanism of action depends entirely on what type of drugs you're receiving from chemotherapy, but in general they work in a few ways, inhibiting cell growth and inducing apoptosis. Inhibiting cell growth can be done by targeting specific cell cycle checkpoints. This is a little advanced for me to go into more detail, but essentially it can pause mitosis at various stages. Since uncontrolled growth is a hallmark of cancer, they are the most affected by this, even if it can inhibit growth of regular cells too. Now another method of chemotherapy uses is to induce apoptosis, and it can do this by, you guessed it, inducing DNA damage. And I guess that's where you got the carcinogen part from. Again, like radiation therapy, it's done for a good cause for the patient since it can cause programmed cell death of cancer cells. But of course, that doesn't mean these drugs can't actually cause cancer, and there have been suspicions that doctors and nurses that work with these drugs may be affected. However, there simply hasn't been enough research to show that that is the case. Alright, now that that's out of the way, what else do you have for us? So these treatments may kill cancer cells, but they also kill healthy cells. So you take a healthy person and put them through this cancer treatment, and they will get very sick. I mean, yeah, it's an unfortunate part of chemotherapy, is that it can damage healthy cells too, but not to the same extent. That's why chemotherapy feels awful to go through. However, if you're a healthy person and the doctor recommends it, then I would say it's worth it to undergo chemotherapy in order to treat your cancer. Radiation is a bit different since it is relatively good at sparing healthy cells due to the way it is performed. So what is this? Why are we, what is this fog that we're under that we're being treated in ways that is actually hurting us? And it is. In fact, two thirds of people being treated with allopathic ways, meaning surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, pass away within five years from their diagnosis. That is the fact. Okay, so again, it's not fair to just look at cancer in general. There are over a hundred different types of cancer and survival rates depend on law on the age of the patient and how far the cancer has progressed. But in general, the most common types of cancers have very decent survival rates. Breast cancer, for example, has a survival rate of nearly 90% and even 100% if it is caught early. Other common forms of cancer, such as prostate, skin, testicular, thyroid, cervical cancers, all generally fall above 60%. But of course, that's not the same for all. Some other relatively common cancers, such as bone cancer or ovarian cancer, are lower, down to nearly 40%. We focus a lot on common types of cancer because, you know, they're more common, so it's no surprise their survival rates are generally higher. You could have some really rare cancers, such as heart cancer, which have incredibly low survival rates. If you have a tumor in your brainstem, for example, you're probably not going to live through that. But yeah, survival rates in general seem to be pretty good. So what's this nonsense of categorizing all cancers together and saying it's a 33% of survival only? There's a, there's a quote that says that in, allop in allopathic medicine, the patient dies from the cure. And that's absolutely true. Dying on the surgery table is not uncommon, but your doctor would surely tell you about the risks before putting you on treatment. If a patient is too old or if the cancer has progressed too far, sometimes it may be better not to undergo treatment since you might not make it through. It depends entirely on the situation. Treatment can damage healthy cells, yes, but that's a risk that has to be weighed against the benefits. And if you are healthy, the answer is most likely that it is worth it. Herbal medicine will never be FDA approved, ever, because herbal medicine comes from plants and you cannot patent plants, natural pet plants in nature. So no one is going to spend the several hundred thousand dollars that it takes to do the testing for FDA approval on a plant that can't be patented. It doesn't make any money. Herbal medicine is generally disregarded when considering treatments for cancer because it simply doesn't work. And you know, alternative medicine proponents always emphasize the value of natural substances. But let me propose something here. Treatments today are heavily dependent on chemicals we find in nature. Antibiotics, for example, are mostly obtained by extraction from, say, a fungus or bacteria. Microorganisms compete against each other, so making an antibiotic themselves that kills other competing bacteria can be very useful. 
human see this and extract that particular compound and it becomes an antibiotic consumed by patients. What I'm saying is a lot of modern drugs come from nature. We don't sit in a laboratory and go like, hmm, if I put these carbons in this alcohol group in this specific way, maybe it'll become an antibiotic. No, that's a waste of time. So let's go back to the herbal medicine that you value so much. Let's say it can indeed cure cancer in some way. In that case, what would happen is that researchers would look into that specific herb and find out what the exact molecule in there is that is curing cancer. Once that is done, it'll be extracted, perhaps modified in some way, and it'll just become another drug that doctors prescribe to patients. That is no different than how many, many drugs are developed today. So in other words, if herbs can cure or treat cancer, it would just become regular modern medicine. Or in your words, allopathic medicine. We can put a man on the moon. We can photograph, we have photographed literally 200 billion galaxies, okay? The astronomical professionals have photographed 200 billion galaxies, okay? A simple Google search shows that astronomer estimates say that there are about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So I guess scientists are so good they were able to photograph galaxies that didn't exist. My husband and I can take our phones and put them next to each other and beam video at each other and beam images. This is the world that we live in. And we don't have progress in our cancer treatment. Like, are we really buying that? Except that we do have progress. Cancer is obviously one of those diseases that is extremely difficult to treat, so progress is going to take some time. Is there similarities to our healthy cells that makes targeting difficult? If you had a bacteria or a viral infection, for example, it can be easy to develop drugs to target those specifically because there are fundamental differences between eukaryotic cells and other microorganisms. Cancer is basically our own cells. If you got into this field of research, you'd understand drug development a bit better, and you'd also see the amount of progress we've made despite it being as difficult as I made it sound to be. So we need to understand that cancer is a very big business and we need to understand how it happened and we need to understand that there are alternatives and that all the alternatives have been sapped because they are a threat to this multi-trillion dollar business. As you can see, it's basically the same claims that alternative medicine proponents all make. It's only a way to make money, blah blah blah. I'm sorry, but that is simply not true. I wish it were that simple, but the truth is it's not. This is reality, and we have to face these hardships head on. It's time to wake up and look at these difficulties for what they are in order to make the world a better place for everyone.